It's Damon and Robert's Five Songs, a podcast starring Damon and Robert. Ten songs enter, ten songs leave. It's not that kind of podcast. Was this tape? in 2024 or not listen yeah that's true we hope they listen but mm, no guarantees (laughs) we make no promises that's right welcome everybody to our podcast five songs episode three three right that's like 15 i don't i don't understand math (laughs) we've done well that's 10 songs every episode so at the end of this episode we will have covered 30 songs that's like five songs public quadrupled i again, <laughs> that's I don't, like I don't five do that. songs times six is that <laughs> yes. right 30 yeah mm-hmm. so 10 songs so we're gonna do 10 more songs yes. this time i picked five i also picked five you picked five it's like we're we had gonna, a plan we had a plan we listened to them before before now there were notes <laughs> taken. Made, i made some notes you make some notes i had some i notes. did yeah. some angry notes i got ooh, why is damon doing this to me <laughs> You know, oddly, I had some angry notes too. Why is Robert doing this? To me? But so we'll talk about that. Three, the payback. The payback. That's right. We call it the grind, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so let's just run the numbers real yes. quick here, as I like to do at the beginning of every episode. So you picked five songs, and those five songs have a total runtime of like six 48 hours. minutes. <laughs> 48 minutes, I Robert. I gave you the homework. It is with an average song time of 9.6 minutes. And one of them's four minutes. So that just tells the audience yes. a little something about some of those big ones are trashing the curve. I went but, for some um, epics. Yeah. You did. And we'll talk about them. I'm, I'm excited to talk about them. Um, earliest year on Robert's list this time out, 1988. Pretty pretty early you know, for Indeed. for you, and the latest is pretty contemporary, 2019. So not you know not, not too far in the rear view. Yep. We can remember 2019. We would probably be recognized. Yes, in 2019, the good <laughs> old days looked, is what we called it. Exactly, we yeah. still looked largely like this. So my five uh, total runtime. Remember your total run time is 48 minutes. Mine mm-hmm. is 22 minutes. <laughs> so a little less than half Robert's yes. run time. This time with an average song length of 4.5 minutes. And here's where the tell is always for me. The earliest song on my list, 1971. That's pretty early. Like neither one of us were born. I do this a lot. Pick the earliest song before either of us were born. And um, latest song, also totally me, it's 1990, which was kind of the year I stopped making musical memories. <laughs> just, just like, stopped, just, that's, you, that's know, you save a lot of money on not buying music. <laughs> that's right. I bought all my music up to 1990 and then yeah. I stopped. So, yeah, I think we have we have a very eclectic mix tonight. I'm excited. to. I talk think we've from... gone further and further outside the boundaries tonight. I think uh, we have. I think we have. I, I'm I'm excited. Yeah. Um, where, would you like me to start? You know what? Let's have you start. That sounds I, good. I will start. All right. I'm going to go with um, the first song I have from Robert's List is Reverie slash Harlequin Forest by Opeth. And this is from 2005. So not the mm-hmm. earliest, not the latest thing on Robert's List this time out from the album Ghost Reveries, I believe, mm-hmm. and it is 11 minutes and 39 seconds long. And in <laughs> just for your benefit, I made my very first note on this is, wow, this is super long. And then I came back later and added, <laughs> he said in naive ignorance. <laughs> so just, just, just to prepare you. So this was, ladies and gentlemen, not the longest song no. we'll talk about tonight. Nope, nope. So yeah, and so here are my thoughts about I, I actually knew Opeth. I think I okay. know I've heard of that band. Like I've heard the name. I confess I didn't know any music. And it, my first impression based wholly like on the length of the track is, wow, that's probably a story song. It's probably it needs time to unwind, you know, a lot of these longer ones. Um, so so that kind of initially piques my interest. And I'm particularly curious to see, like, is it a self-contained story? Is it part of a larger story like the Coheed and Cambria stuff where it's like a section that's kind of cool, but I can understand it as part of a bigger thing? Um 
I think music wise, would we call would we be okay to call this progressive metal? Can I start using yep, that term? Absolutely. Okay. So yeah. yeah. So um it feels like you know it's got a prog metal feel to it. It's got that kind of like tightly wound, it really cohesive. I mean, these bands are always like to everyone Very you pick has been like super tight. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And um and they're really, you know, it's got that kind of like super aggressive stuff to it, less so than some of the other stuff we'll look at on your <laughs> list. Actually, it's one of the less aggressive ones, I think. But um, but I like it. It does. Um, I, I actually went looking for like terms to talk about these oh, because I feel nice. like I'm I'm struggling a little bit. And one of the things I that helped me a lot is a lot of classical composers will oh. look at Opeth's music and talk about it because it's very and the word that they use, which I like a lot, is it's very symphonic Ooh. in the sense that it doesn't really follow like you know a, a three minute song structure. It follows right. more like a symphony structure where there, there are movements, movements. there yeah. are pauses, you know, there are changes in mood and um, yeah. Yeah, and it just I, I like that like this feels very symphonic to me and i even kind of noted as we go along because it's long because it's got that 11 minute sun spool there are a lot of places where like there's a cool acoustic kind of break like three mm -hmm. minutes in where it sort of just becomes a different song for a minute and then like around six minutes it does it again with kind of this i don't even know how to describe it but um it strikes me as kind of like a very sort of like a lead break, but it's really vast and almost like fantastical, you know, like back in like the Black Sabbath days when Dio was singing for them. It's like you'd open up a Black Sabbath album and like it would have a Hobbit on it or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not a Hobbit. You know, it feels like grand and kind of, you know, inspiring and fantastical, like a like a fantasy novel almost is being, you know, narrated to you. Um, so I really like I dig that. Um and yeah, it tells a story. I think I don't. I think it's like a, it, maybe it's a standalone story because I don't know that it's part of a larger epic. But I don't fully understand it either. So it could be part of a larger epic, and that's why I don't understand it. Um, what else? You know, I really uh, the the standout to me here is the vocalist. This guy's amazing. He's got, uh, and and that's true for a lot of the vocalists in these bands. But what's really neat about this guy's voice is he's like in a middle range with his vocals that nobody else really sits in. Like I always think of these guys as kind of pitching high mm -hmm. to go over stuff and to cut over all that kind of crunch that's going on. But um, but this guy's like it's kind of like a middle range. It's a lower voice and it's really nice like it's really warm and somehow i don't know how exactly it cuts through perfectly fine like i can understand him all the time so he's the principal um, songwriter and he probably sits in the mixer's chair next to the mixer. <laughs> that's a, that helps it can't yes. hurt now i will say there are a couple times where it goes to cookie monster voice and i'm like yes. who's doing the cookie monster voice Same and guy. it's him yes. it's him i saw it because i went and watched a video of him of him do it which is really impressive because it's like a super low yeah. like growly monstery cooker cookie monster voice so yeah so opef um reverie harlequin forest it seems to be like narrative wise like a guy's being the narrator's being chased into the woods maybe by there's maybe wolves i don't know <laughs> i kind of yep. lose it but there's sort of some monster or some force in the woods or in him maybe that yeah so i kind of lose the 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 particularness of the story um here but it doesn't bother me because it's just such a fun ride mm -hmm. for that you know 12 minutes i get to have it's it's like hearing four songs um about this and the the cookie monster voice i will confess always makes me giggle a little bit because i think it's the cookie monster voice and that's kind of funny to me which Once i know is probably that, the opposite yeah. yeah well it's kind of the opposite of what you want though you wanted like oh it's scary yeah, demon this is this is demon, demon voice stuff. right but yeah so so i'm curious to hear you talk about this i i liked it and um yeah i'm what can you tell me about this tune robert so opeth is swedish death metal originally um they okay. have changed over the years and they have morphed very much into their prog rock even even away from prog metal he no longer yeah. does the harsh vocals at all okay uh, he doesn't scream anymore i don't think his voice can do it in his you know yeah his 40s and I, he may be 50 but he's probably still in his 40s um this is from Ghost Reveries. As you said, Ghost Reveries is a concept album, which is, okay, so of course, is very, story. very prog. Yep. The yes, whole thing very is a prog, story. very concept album. Um, the, the concept is, and I think this is super cool and, and right up your alley. Yeah. Um, the guy's mom is dying. The, the narrator's mom is passing okay. away. But as she's dying, he 
starts to think she's been possessed by the devil. Oh. Like, yeah. either she says something in like a fever dream and he's going, that's not right. That or, like you know, right. it, it, it's a whole thing. <laughs> so he ends up killing her and it's kind of a mercy wow. killing. Yeah. At the same time, he's killing his Maybe mother. Maybe not. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. He may or may not be possessed by right. the devil. Right. Uh, it's a whole, and it, and it's there's oh, a lot wow. of this. Maybe she is, and maybe she isn't, and it's the story right. doesn't kind really ever tell that. you what the truth is. Right? Um, did you kill your mom or did you kill your demon? Right? Your yeah, yeah. Were you right. doing a yeah. good deed or a terrible deed? Yeah, exactly. Did you yeah. do the best thing you could do or the worst thing you could do? Right? <laughs> exactly. Right. So a lot of the story is him on the run. He's got you know the, the people chasing him. Okay. He's got yeah, dogs. Yeah. He's got wolves. He's right. got possibly the devil himself chasing him. You know, and right. he doesn't know. He's he's very much. You know, out of his mind through most of the story. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a really interesting album, and I don't think the ending is super clear. Like I said, I yeah. don't think you ever Ambiguous. really get a sense yeah. of was he in the right, was he tricked, one way or the other. Yeah, um, I like that. I like. Yeah, yeah I, I don't need to be spoon fed the, the no. ending if you can if you can make it compelling up to the end and let that's me right. sit with it. That's okay. The storytelling is good. So. That's right. Yeah, no, um, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Is is that true for all their albums? Are they they tend to do like concept albums even as they've shifted away from the metal or are they They do kinda... themes but not concepts, I'd okay. say. Like I'd yeah. say that they have um stuff that's a, a similar bent. So they do have a couple of the concept albums. They have one where um they're kind of, you know, sort of pseudo medieval fantasy whatever that yeah that line. yeah whatever um, <laughs> we don't know how to um, talk about a man it, but and I woman know you know mean. are betrothed and then her parents deny him and they cast him out or whatever and he comes back and takes revenge on like the whole village type thing yeah um and that too the the devil is a very big tempter in their stories mm -hmm. uh, he's not a good guy he's just kind of a wicked loki sort of figure of you should go kill everybody in that village. Yeah, that's right, what just you like should do. sitting on your shoulder telling yeah. you to kill people. Um, you know, they the wronged you, does. and the right thing to do is take revenge. Exactly. So, right. Mm, that's how, that's I, I really enjoy like them. The double. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's kind of his role. Um, <laughs> subtle manipulator. Anyway, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's fantastic stuff. And again, I wasn't going for all long songs. I, I but know I you were. <laughs> I didn't assume you were like trying I to make it. There. A long list, but but it is, and that's okay. We'll talk. About it. <laughs> but but yeah, that's a. If you're gonna, there are many worse ways I could spend twelve minutes than listening to this story <laughs> from Opeth and listen to that guy. Yeah, I just really like musically. I think they hit like they're a little softer than some of the prog metal yeah. that we've listened to, which is makes it a little easier to go down with me or like right away. And his voice, I just like a lot. Like I think yeah. it's really cool what he can do. I think I talked voice. about this before. I like a lot the the ones that that go between singing and growling, or what they call harsh vocals. Yeah, or whatever. Right. I like the dichotomy. I like that you can have melody and discordance mesh together. I think that that makes a more interesting song than than all discordance. Right. I can be okay mm -hmm. with all melody, but like I can't handle something that's just <laughs> all screaming discordance. start to yeah. end. So, yeah, but you but bag. you do enjoy it in parts like or either yes. in you know bursts i can Excellent. have like a little discordance or a little chaos in you know to disrupt my melody as long as we little come spice. back or yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little little spice that's a nice way to put it <laughs> all right and that makes an excellent segue because that's our business these days. That is segues. Segues to your first song <laughs> which is paint a vulgar picture. Paint a vulgar Smith. picture. Yes. Um so let's let's dive in. Uh let's dive so in. First off, it's got good and jangly guitars. I mean, very much uh, yeah. mm -hmm. a lot of this jangly guitar stuff. I think of the 90s, but I know yeah. this is the 80s. This is the late 80s. But I suspect tell, that the yeah. 90s alternative <laughs> bands are kind of aping the Smiths. Correct. Like they went, that sounds cool. We could do a lot of that. Exactly. Um, <laughs> the second thing is nobody else sings like Morrissey. I think Morrissey, kind of yeah. a class of his own. Both as a singer and an asshole. <laughs> Which we'll talk about that. We'll too, certainly address sure. that. <laughs> uh, the first listen to the song, I thought, it's biting the hand that feeds. Uh, yeah. It seems so British that you can <laughs> sound sweet, but be tearing people structurally superfluous new assholes. That's right. Uh, that is yes, something pretty, that the British seem critical. to do. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, please go to hell, but have a most pleasant trip on your way. To <laughs> That's what that, that is the British way to say it. <laughs> so second spin. And yes, I still call them spins when I listen That's, to songs. That's good. That's nice. Uh, check school. the pattern or check the lyrics rather, which is my yeah. pattern. Uh, didn't get this part about it being the dead artist. I didn't catch that yeah. on the first go around. 
Um, but both the record company and the fans, or just a fan, it's not really clear if it's, it's right. a singular yeah. person or not, uh, kind of reviewing the legacy of that dead artist, their output, what they meant to them. Um, and the record label, of course, is milking it the utter until dust comes out. <laughs> Uh, but the fans are, you know, they're kind of culpable too. That's because right. Because when you're a dead artist, you're very malleable. Like you can be made into lots of different things that may not have yeah. had any sense in, in your life. But yeah. in death, you can mean things that you didn't necessarily mean before. That's right. Um, a dead artist is, is can be a true love. Whereas, you know, in life, they'd right. be like, I never met you, lady, or, or sir. <laughs> That's a, uh, right. It's easier to love somebody dead because they're not all complicated and changing. That's right. And, <laughs> and, and they don't refuse, and please don't mm-hmm. read into that. Um, <laughs> no, wait, wait, that's right. No, no necrophilia. Uh, <laughs> I think there's some irony in Morrissey, you know, years, years later, singing about, you know, releasing greatest hits packages. How yeah. many greatest hits packages have the Smiths released? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, we their, like their whole discography was messed up. Like they had very few albums and re-released everything. Yes. Yeah, it's crazy. And it's not all the record labels' fault. So there's there's just a yeah. little bit of a frisson, if you will. Of course, there. of course. Um, so it's a great song. I really I, I thought it was really good, and I thought it worked on a couple different levels. Both, you know, it it, it kind of attacks everybody but the artist. I don't think the artist really gets blamed for dying. Um, <laughs> not for dying. It's sort of this. Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's sort of this. Oh, what a shame. Oh, let's rake in the cash. Or yeah. oh, let's you know make not a martyr, but kind of a a malleable symbol out of this dead person. Yeah. Based upon their musical output, which isn't that even that much. That's okay. We can work with what we we'll got. Repackage it. And yeah. 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 Right, so, it. Yeah. What um what made you pick the song? Well, I I. I love the Smiths I, in the eighties and nineties. Like I got hooked on the Smiths and like, like just that jangly guitar sound mm-hmm. and Johnny Marr kind of was the guy, the guitar player wrote all pretty much all the music and is sort of famous for being kind of like the other half, like Morrissey would write the words and right. Marr would write the, the music. But, um, but I think just musically, it's just tons of fun, like a lot. Mm, I, yeah, I just love that jangly kind yeah. of 90 sound. And like you say, nobody really sings like Morrissey. He's got a very distinct vocal style. His delivery. Um, totally. Yeah, his delivery is very, very recognizable and very Morrissey. But um, but I like really like the content of the song. And I think you hit on the things that, that I really like about it. Like, it's kind of an indictment of everybody. Yeah. And, like, it starts off very much, you're like, oh, it's an indictment of the music industry, which, which it kind of is. And apparently their record company kind of took umbrage and they had to say, hey, this isn't about you guys. <laughs> this is just like broadly about the, about the music industry and yeah. like how it deals with death, uh, dead artists and things. But so, so it sort of starts out very pointedly to the industry industry but and kind of you know stuff that's real relevant and that i think we think about a lot like you know like commodification of the artist or like trying to like wring value out of art by recycling it or dumbing it down or just repackaging it and selling it again but there's also this guy there's this neat sort of bit with the where i don't think the artist gets off the hook either because there's this Mm -hmm. kind of recurring refrain where it's like but you could have said no yeah. If you wanted to, it's like you could have walked away, like, and, and so there's this, which which I thought was kind of a unique piece to add. Like normally right. we can say like, well, the artist is kind of sacrosanct in this, and he's above reproach in this, and like whatever the artist does is okay, but they, they kind yeah. of imply that well they're implicated in this too. Like the whole thing doesn't work unless they say yes. Um, so you've got that kind of piece going on, and then there's this whole other sort of story added in by a fan. I think it's just a single fan but it's mm. hard to to know for sure but, but they could be of, talking for all fans it's right kind of, yeah, exactly it's yeah kind yeah. of and it, they, it does have that kind of like every man kind of quality where they're sort of like longing to be close to the artist to be noticed but they're afraid they're unworthy you know he talks about you know like oh i i'm just a kid from those ugly new houses you know yeah. you could never you could never be like you and and that sort of comes and it go it comes in i think once in like the second verse and comes back again so so it's kind of neat how he weaves the two together mm-hmm. and and makes it a really cohesive whole when I wouldn't necessarily think that this kind of omniscient, hey, the music industry is screwing everybody and this very kind of personal story about a fan and an artist would mesh this well together. But but they really do. And it's kind of a satisfying sort of like, you know, bittersweet. <laughs> 
pill everybody sucks together yeah. <laughs> that's right yeah. we're kind of like you know it's like a, the, the whole thing sucks but it's not you know don't don't overlook your role in it right. it's like everybody has a hand in making this bad um which which is pretty cool now let's talk about the elephant in the room <laughs> 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 Morrissey is a nightmare. <laughs> you can't open the internet. You can't look anywhere without finding like 10 shitty things that Morrissey said that you vehemently disagree with. Yeah. So I told Robert, I'm putting this on the list, but I'm kind of torn about it because it's, it's this art and artist debate that happens a lot now. And there's lots of people, you know, in this sort of bind right now from, Harry Potter fans to Smith fans, yeah. you know, you got the whole gambit. There's a yep. lot of people who love sort of the art that people have made and suddenly likely due to the, you know, the internet making everything really accessible have found out that, Hey, these people who make this art that I love They're have some ideas that are kind of aberrant to me yeah. or that like I can't get down with, or that sound like really backward. And, and I think it's left me, I mean, I, with the Smiths, my, I've kind of punted a little and said, well, there's a lot of people in that band. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's not just that band, you're fine. Johnny Marr's a good guy. <laughs> and that bass player, Andy Rourke, he's really good. You know, so I'm like, there's other people yeah. in the band. It's not just Morrissey. But at the same time, there's a part of me that thinks that's a little disingenuous because what really attracted me to their music was always the lyrics, yeah. always the word, like the way he would craft those words and sentiments over the lyrics so so i don't know what to do luckily i already own all these smiths albums so i don't have to give him any more money <laughs> but but yeah i think it's a it's it's an interesting conundrum and it seems to come up a lot and and increasingly yeah yeah this what, never what, used to happen you didn't know how bad people were what their behavior I, was i mean it's like you'd hear like rock stars especially they they get somebody pregnant they trash hotel rooms <laughs> You know, right. they fire people over creative differences. I'm like, okay, they're kind of jerks. I, I right. wouldn't want to be in the room with them. That's fine. But right. like increasingly, they challenge your ability to enjoy their output because, you know, they'll go up like, uh, I was never a Nugent fan, but let's say Chris Rock. Yeah. I'm not I'm sorry. Kid Rock. Sorry, yeah. Chris Rock. Chris sorry, Rock. Sorry, Chris so Rock. Apologies to Chris, Chris Rock, Rock. <laughs> who, is, who is, shall remain blameless in this. <laughs> At this time. <laughs> At this time. Um, <laughs> Kid Rock. Can't say I was a big fan of Kid Rock, but at least I could say, you know, he's he's harmless. Now right, I'm he's thinking not... he's an idiot. He's you know, <laughs> exactly he all right. Kinds of MAGA yeah. stupid shit, and I'm just like, I would never want to listen to his stuff. I own one of his albums. I think it's the first one, yeah. and and you know, I'm not going to go burn it. I don't care enough to go find it in the box <laughs> and right. destroy it. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's... I agree with you 100. Yeah. percent and, yeah. and I I think it's okay to enjoy their art and hate the artist, or at least. Wish the artist would shut the hell up. And yeah, let you enjoy their stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think it's impossible for it not to color your impression yes. of that art. But you know, the the truth is, like, I learned the song when I was seventeen. You're not gonna like. It's gonna be hard to dislodge my association with it now. This many years ago, but anytime I hear the Smiths music now, I have that. There's kind of a thin film yeah. over the top of it that reminds me. They don't forget. <laughs> a little Morrissey egg. went like wonky and crazy. He was probably always like that. We just did to your point. Right. Just didn't know. And um, so yeah, I I don't condone it. <laughs> I don't I don't agree with him. <laughs> but um, yeah, but I do kind of feel like I I got to make these decisions like case by case because i'm like well i'm not paying morrissey any money but but it, it's a whole different thing i have to think of now it's like how can i enjoy this product without like further supporting the the person who has these you know offensive ideas that i, I felt this way pay. i felt this way about the ender's game movie because yeah. i love the ender's game book and then I read about all the awful things Orson Scott Card has said. And yeah. I was just like, hmm, let's wait till this is on free somewhere. <laughs> right? Yeah. But it's so hard now. It's like, it I, is. you know, if you like, if you could go down the rabbit hole, you're like, well, even if I watch it for free, the commercials yeah. are paying yeah. him. You know, you're like, ah, you can drive yourself crazy. I feel particularly for people who are, I, I watched a YouTube video of a guy who was trying to justify buying a Harry Potter board game. 
<laughs> because mm. he loves Harry Potter. Yeah. Grew up, grew up with Harry Potter, and really thinks this board game sounds cool. But he's like, God, I don't want to give J.K. Rowling any more money now, knowing what yeah. I know about her, her views, particularly about trans women and all that uh, transphobia and, and all that jazz, which we're not going <sighs> to dig into nope. the details of here. Go watch a YouTube video. <laughs> yeah, I, but say, I felt bad Google for the guy. It's not hard to find. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. clears throat> But, uh, but I felt bad. I'm like, that's a, I'm like, I get it. I'm like, if I, if I drop this $30 on this game, um, some of that's going back He's to her. Like, don't, yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. I don't want to do that. Um, so I know it's a, it's a widespread problem yeah. now. And I think my, I don't know, I got no great advice, except I'm kind of dealing with it on a case by case basis <laughs> right now. And I think, you know, whatever anybody decides to do with it, if you decide you can't, listen to that anymore i get that's it the right you know answer. if that's the if right you decision listen to for it, you that's also the right you can't listen yeah. to it that's the right answer you know if you if you're like me you're like i can't like let it go because of these associations that i made then i say you know what that's it's more yours than theirs at that point right. you know and so it's like you don't know, you know, do what makes it, what you can feel okay <laughs> right. about i think very good Oh. An excellent segue. I don't think it's a segue at all. To our next song. <laughs> An excellent segue to our next song, which is Sweet Sister Mary by Queensryche. Now, okay, this, that's a completely inappropriate segue, but all right, we're going to roll is, it. <laughs> it's totally fine. It's like a <laughs> non prostitute connection. I don't, there is no connection. Um, but this was the early, well, I guess here's a connection. This is mm. the, this came out the very next year. Yes. As Paint a Vulgar Picture was 87, this was 88. Um, I know of Queensryche. I don't think it's possible to like like any metal music in the 80s and not know who Queensryche was. They were huge. Even if you hated album. them, you at least knew what they That's were. That's right. Yeah, this yeah. is 1988. It's off Operation Mindcrime, which was a really famous concept album at the time. And I think for a couple of reasons. First, nobody was really doing concept albums at that time. You know, it right. had kind of fallen out of favor a little bit. But they had a dirty name. You know, yeah. prog rock seventies had kind of right. made them untouchable. Yeah. yeah. And nobody did metal <laughs> like concept out. Like I'm right. A, the idea of a metal concept album was, I think, really foreign. And there was this kind of, you know metal music was looked down upon a fair deal in the eighties. And I think a lot of people would have been surprised that the most metal bands could have put together a concept album. Frankly, I think there was sort of this feeling were, that a lot of metal bands metal. are dialing it in, Yeah, you know, but, um, and this has like a real story and narrative scope. Like it's really well produced and it sounds like you listen to like this song in particular and it's like a movie. I mean, you've got like the Foley sound effects, you've got the dialogue, you got like, you know, you can hear the car window rolling down (laughs) at the beginning of it. It's really slickly done. Um, so like anybody who's not familiar with this album, you should just go listen to the whole thing because it's really worth your time. Um, and and I love his voice too. I've I've wrote that it was cinematic, but you know what the word that I came back and replaced it with was it's operatic. Like he has this commanding voice, and it's it's more metal like traditional in the sense that it's a pretty high voice. And I mean he can belt it and and use it, um, but he gets like this high vocal drama out of it like really like you really feel like the character being conflicted about this terrible thing he's trying to do and the struggle um so yeah i think he's fantastic and i forget his name i'm sure you can tell me but Jeff um, Tate. there you go yeah and the lady who plays mary um who sings the part of mm-hmm. mary pamela moore is also fantastic like mm-hmm. a great metal vocalist i'm glad you looked um, her up because i had, i'm desperately trying to think of her name and i'm like i had ah, yeah i had to look good, her name good. up because i ran across it a couple times and i'm like oh yeah i remember yeah yeah um but yeah so it's easy she's to awesome yeah no she's great um this feels to me too as i was listening to it like kind of an early um like a forerunner of a lot of the like prog metal like it's mm-hmm. not here it's real thin compared to that stuff right but i'm like oh i can kind of like feel some of it because it's the got, gestation yeah. yeah it feels symphonic in ways too and like like it's more like in movements than sections i think it really is like verse chorus i think it has those sections that i could identify if i got real down into the nitty gritty <laughs> with it but it feels like it flows um, at the behest of the story mm-hmm. rather than like at the behest of a st- song structure that we're used to. Um, 
it's lengthy again kind of giving it the time to unspool not that it's about 10 minutes 10 minutes long this time it's not but it's not a pop song no yeah no it's it's not it tells a narrative story and it takes the time that it needs to to um to do that i mean in, in that sense you know i i think the the only thing that I struggle with in tunes like this is that because it's concerned of like, that's its artistic vision. I got to get this mm-hmm. story across. Right. You know, it's more concerned with that than does it have a good beat and can you dance to it? Right. It's not going to be that kind of song. It's going to be a song that uses the music to kind of t- to punctuate the narrative and to kind of help tell the story. And I think that's great. Um, you know, it for, particularly works really well, well, well here. Um, I did write, it's much sparser than something like Opeth. And that's just like that eighties, like this sounds like eighties metal right. to me, like in the terms of tone and delivery, which I know we've talked about before. Like when we talked about the King Diamond stuff, we're like, it's cool, but it's clearly from the eighties. Like yeah. you can just tell. It's a four track um, recorder. They didn't have right. a lot to go on. Yeah. Yeah, there's particular like, you know, 80s production choices. So this album, I was glad to see you picked it on the list because it always stood as kind of a signpost to me. Like things kind of changed with uh, like Operation Mindcrime opened the door, I think, for a lot of other different types of music and different bands um people were willing i think to give bands a little more leeway it's like hey this band like ripped out this awesome concept album maybe we should see if some other people can can do that kind of thing too it's okay so, to be smart yeah exactly yeah. so i'm curious were you were, were you a fan back in 88 when this happened when it's it came funny. out i i started metal and i think 86 okay um which was around the time i think of metallica's Kill them all. Oh no, I'm sorry. Master of Puppets. Master of Puppets. Um, so Queensryche, this was one of my first albums in the, you know, the first 10, 12, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I was a Queensryche fan, and I still am, uh, even though they they don't have Jeff Tate is no longer singing with them. He's doing solo now. They had a big okay. acrimonious split up. Um, uh, but I, I've been a fan of theirs since I heard the very first uh notes of this song. Um, yeah. I think it's Revolution Calling was on MTV. I was like, yeah. what the hell is that? Um and I love them. I've seen them live five or six times. I got yeah. to meet most of the band. Oh, cool. Um, I won dinner with um, the guitarist and the bass player. Nice. Or no, the two guitarists, rather. A uh, long, long time ago from a radio station. Cool. Super, super cool. You had dinner with the guitar player. I had That's dinner cool. with um, nice. with uh, Chris DeGarmo right. and Michael Wilton. Nice. Uh, yeah, God, that was... <laughs> that was a long 90... time ago, dude. <laughs> Seven ninety eight, something in that realm. Yeah, not quite thirty um, years ago, but yeah, yeah. long, long yeah. time ago. But anyway, long time ago. Um, this song, I mean, it is epic. It, it, you're right. It has movements. It has yeah. th- this really cool story element, and the guitars kind of wind around it. Very kind of, I think, a very serpentine. Like they kind of just weave yeah, good, around yeah. the lyrics and, and yeah, whatever. That's a great term. And and he and it's sometimes it goes from you know really soft to and they, they yeah, jerk yeah. the tension up. Yeah. Um, because the character is, is a drug addict, uh, in addition yeah, to some other, the, some the other fun things. So <laughs> he kind of is a little bit erratic, and he goes from zero to 100 um, hard. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the music does that, too. I think that they right, definitely elevate it. things uh, all the way up and then you know, tone it back down and let it's soft and it's calm. And then it's, you know, there's, they don't scream. He doesn't, I mean, he's got, he's loud, but he doesn't do the yeah. harsh vocals like right. Opeth. Anyway. It's a it's a phenomenal listen. If you ever, you know, get the opportunity to be in a car and it's raining and it's yeah. late at night, just like put the seat back, turn this on, and just like ah, yeah, the effects are amazing. amazing. Like yeah, like the yes. foley effects with the rain. I was thinking like that rain and that thunder. Like that's got to be the best like rain and thunder effects I hear I, in it's, that it's era. Really cool. Like it was yeah. on a lot of albums. Tried to do stuff like that, but I'm like these guys nailed it. And I'm yeah. curious with all because when we put together this list, one of the things we talked about was, well, you know, sometimes album, like a whole album pops out to me and it's hard to pick a single song. What, what led you to pick this particular song off of that album? Probably just the fact that this gives me chills. A lot of, a lot of the album does, but in particular, especially the duetting parts. Yeah. Um, So live, this is, this is a total aside. Um, He'd actually sing it. She wouldn't be in the concert most of the time, but she'd be on the screen, recorded her parts. Okay. More. Yeah. And he would be singing to her on the screen. And like periodically she'd say things and he would like fall over and like roll down the <laughs> stage. Like he'd been wow. shot. Yeah. And it was just, it was so oh, that's you know, amazing. And metal at the time. I mean, some of the hair metal bands had a little bit of cinematic, 
type stuff. Yeah, sure. But mostly it was you stand in one place, you play your music towards the audience, and you look angry. Right. That's and right. You try to make your hair as big that. as you can, and yeah, you yeah. play the music. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. wink at the girls, but you don't have That's any other emotions. That's yeah. right. No, no non-girl related emotions, please. What? Yeah. Now, yeah. now there was a sequel to this, right? Yes. And it, do I understand that Ronnie James Dio had something to do with the sequel? He did. He did. He. I think he's on two songs, one or two songs okay. of the sequel. It's not as good as this. Sure. It, well, it's, it's a sequel. So yeah, uh, but yeah, I I think somehow I missed the sequel, but I did as I was looking for because yeah yeah I just hadn't thought about this album for a years. But I remember like I had a buddy who loved it, and we used to listen to it all the time. Um, so uh, definitely familiar with it, but I didn't know they did a sequel. And then I was excited to read that the Ronnie James Dio was like the bad guy or something. Yeah, the, yeah. like the 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 new bad guy in the second one, and apparently there may be concert footage of the one oh, live performance that he did cool. with them for that. I'm I like, oh, that might be worth scoping out. So yeah, Tracking man, down. that's a fun pick. I liked it a lot. I enjoyed it. It's, and, and I mean, that is a song for nearly 30 years now that I've loved. And yeah. I will continue it's, to it's love nice, it. It's nice, isn't so it? Good. When you can kind of age one like that, yes. you're like, man, I love this tune just as much as I did in the 80s. And I just Absolutely. love it a little differently now, or, you know, a little <laughs> more. Right. A little more something. That's right. right. More something. Now, moving on. Now your oldest song. If My I oldest song. Yeah, that's a, I'm sure that sounds good on the video. So I'm trying to <laughs> fine. not do that. Uh, notes. Notes. All right, here we go. Uh, your song uh, two. two. Song two. <laughs> I'm all, I messed up, man. You okay, man? Um, you okay, Robert? You do. <laughs> all right. Deep <laughs> cleansing breath. That's right. Mm. Song two, Sam okay. Stone by John Prime. That's John a lot Prime. of names in, in one. It title. is. It's a lot. It's a lot of very generic sounding <laughs> names in one title. <laughs> so we're uh, we're driving forward on your bitterness bitterness tour here. We, uh, we are. <laughs> I was aware of John Prime. Uh, you know, I know he's okay. a folk artist. Yeah. I don't think I've listened to any of his songs ever, so had no exposure. Yep. Uh, my folk listening is pretty light, though. I'm not, yeah. it's not, not, not a genre not I reach genre. for. I know. That's yeah. right. Mm. Alice's Restaurant, favorite mm-hmm. folk song. There you go. Probably See. can't name too many other ones. <laughs> um, so this song, musically, pretty simplistic. I mean, it's it's folk does not go you know too hard on, on any instrumentation. even for a folk song. <laughs> I think it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is another song because we had one in in episode one about right. leaving or coming back from the war, but not leaving the war behind, bringing the yeah. war along with you. Uh, at least this is the drug addiction from the war, the self medication and the self destruction that he's carried with him uh, back from Vietnam. I think it's Vietnam. It doesn't really ever yeah. state that yeah. clearly. Yeah, yeah. Time time frame that that sets right. Yeah. But uh, this one is particularly disturbing because it's a child's perspective of watching. Uh, him spiral down, destroying not himself alone, but yeah. taking his family with him, uh, and and particularly taking his kids down with him. I mean, the the line "Jesus Christ died for nothing," I suppose, is a gut punch. Oh yeah, that that is that <laughs> right. is a bitter bitter statement, especially from the lips of a kid. That's right. Mm. Um, and then uh, this is spoiler warning. I hope you've listened to the song by now, folks. <laughs> Please um, listen to the song. His overdose, even dying requires the family to give up their house so that he can be buried <laughs> in a casket right. with a flag. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. So, happy, happy <laughs> song you found Gave here. you another happy one, Robert. Yeah, but, I mean, you know. this is, I, and, and most folk is not, you know, like, lovey-dovey. It's, it's, I understand he did a lot of anti-war songs. Um, yeah. <laughs> but this one, this is hard. This was yeah. dark. It is. I, I think it's, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think it's fair. You want me to to, to die? Absolutely. I don't want to cut you off. Yes. But yeah. No, no, no I'd love I'd... to hear why you think this is. Uh, <laughs> why? I just love that. Yeah. Well, for John Prine, for anybody who doesn't know him, should go find out who John Prine is because he's a fantastic songwriter, and he does this this type of song. Um, they they tend to be like very straightforward and often like terribly heartbreaking yeah. but the thing that i love about him and what i think really shines through here is he's always like he's got empathy for everybody 
in this song and you feel it like it's right. not it's There's not no an angry the war that's right it's not yeah. an angry song like sam stone the you know the guy who the the lead the main character if you want to say is not a hero in the song but he's not demonized either right. like he says very clearly like what he does and why he does it and they're not good things you know there's one uh there's the line in there about, you know, he eased his mind in the hours that he chose while the kids ran around wearing other people's clothes. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, it's, it's just very sort of matter of fact, but kind of, but heartbreaking this. Yeah. And as you pointed out, it's really kind of thumps on the impact to everybody around him, his whole family, and particularly the children that, you know, have this, who see their father kind of, you know, struggle with this and eventually die from it. Um, so it's, it is very dark. And I think it's probably like one of the darkest songs, like Prine generally tends to be a little more, you know, jokey kind of nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you know, but there are very heartfelt. None of that in here. Yeah. But, but yeah, you know, very, you get some great heartbreak there too. <laughs> but, yeah. but this one I, I think is stark and, and that whole, like the little, chorus thing there i think that's just probably the most devastating rhyming couplet i know in english the, there's a hole in daddy's arm where yes. all the money goes and jesus christ died for nothing i suppose i'm like that like if you can write two better like rhyming lines than that i don't know what they are i'm not even particularly religious yeah but yeah but but that but the jesus christ died for nothing line is just devastating it's like oh god it's like you know it doesn't matter you know the, the no sacrifice there's no way to save somebody from this it's yeah so so i thought um uh we needed a, a super folky song on the <laughs> list and i love john prine i think he's a great songwriter he died unfortunately in 2020 due to covid mm. not a not a not a big fan of the administration at that time <laughs> but, but anyway he um he was a uh, He's got tons of songs, and they're they're very stripped down. They tend to be a lot like this. He's kind of a talking songwriter, but yeah, anybody who's who's not aware, um, I would check him out just for just because he's a great writer and one of those that I think it's a very powerful song. There's no denying that this song hits you. Right across the face. So, <laughs> yeah, and Vietnam again. I mean, you know, like yeah. we talked about with the first one, I think is, this was 71. So Prine was in the army, but I think he was stationed in Germany as a mechanic. So didn't actually go, but knew a lot of people yeah. who went to Vietnam and didn't come back. Very um, effective. kind of wrote this song, you know, uh, in honor of, of the people that he knew that had fought the war and been, you know, even came back, but didn't really, weren't really able to come back. Just as an aside, there's a version, a cover version of it by uh, Nathaniel Radcliffe. Oh, yeah, I know Nathaniel Radcliffe. I think Radcliffe. has, uh, yeah. what's the name of his band? The Night Sweats. Night Sweats, yeah. Uh, with John Prime before oh, he died. Oh, really? It's real good. Oh, real that's good. great. Yeah, I was oh, just doodling around mm -hmm. and caught that and thought, um, certainly not better than the original, but very a very cool kind of, because they do some alternating of the, the lines and stuff like that. Yeah, so, yeah. It's worth, and, worth yeah. And I mean, the instrumentation on this was really simple on the yeah. album and kind of stripped down and, and sort of naked. And you can find a lot of live versions of him doing it that are a little richer. And that's cool that he does like he, he did a lot of that when folks covered a lot of his songs mm -hmm. and he would frequently perform with them if he was able to, which is cool. Gotcha. So mm -hmm. a good. gracious guy, I think. Mm -hmm. So that is a good transition <laughs> <laughs> into Squeeze it, the third best track on Robert's list, which could not be more John Prine like if we tried, which is Let Go by Fru Fru. I was going to say, I'm trying to think of what is coming up next. I'm like, I don't think any of them work, but okay, let let's go, see where he's going with this. Let Go by Fru Fru from the album Details in 2002 is is what I've got here. And in, in the shortest song on Robert's list yes. this week. Uh, and and nothing much, like the other songs. <laughs> clocking it at four minutes say. 13. It really is. It's so different in the midst of all these. I was like a, a moment of cognitive dissonance. <laughs> <laughs> I had to listen to it a couple times. The palette cleanser. But yeah, I really like it. It's a it's very different. It's not prog metal. It's like it feels like European, kind of like mm -hmm. a, almost like electronic European music with like yep. some stringy stuff in it. You know, I, I even kind of made the 
the note here that it feels kind of like what house music would feel like without the pounding bass. It's like right. I put the pounding bass over it, it would be house music, but <laughs> you it's could not. Remix it like, to that. Oh, sure. Yeah. You take it away and it's got this kind of ethereal quality, but it's got a nice melody to it. Um, it's got this, I don't know whether it's a bass or a string part. There's something that does this like little wiggle that I want. It's all electronic. So is it? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's all. I don't believe there's a single stuff. string instrument involved. I think it's all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's probably right. Um, so I liked it a lot. It feels actually, I wrote, it feel, this feels like it would be at home on my list. And not <laughs> it's like one I could have suggested See? to you, but I mean, I'm it's great. Deaf. And it's got like the, the, uh, the sort of refrain is there's beauty in the breakdown, which is just a lovely line. Like, and it's sung really like beautifully too. And yeah. it's just this idea, you know, that there's some, some kind of like, you know, that magic can get in from broken things, you know, like there's some, some value there. Um, and, um, I thought I recognized it. Like, there's something like nagging me about it. So I did a little research on this one and I think I probably knew it from the garden state movie soundtrack because i'm like man this seems really familiar and i listened to it a bunch of times isn't um, that so a great soundtrack it is it's a fantastic sound it's a fantastic i was really soundtrack. taken by it when it yeah when it came out no it's got that great colin hay tune on it it's oh, got this God, it's yes. got yeah damn right? that's gonna be on my future list <laughs> oh yeah put that on the list we should definitely talk about <laughs> colin hay man not just about men at work but we can do that uh, too. whole but, episode yeah, i really like this I, I i and i guess i in my research i did find out it's basically like two people right like a, mm-hmm. somebody who does the music and like she sings mm-hmm. and um yeah i just really liked it i didn't write much about it because i just enjoyed it i listened to it over and over again but i didn't have a whole lot to say about it except man yeah i could just put this on one of my lists i think it's a real easy tune to listen to it kind of it's energetic and it never you know it, it never bogs me down or I never kind of get bored with it. Like it always ends before I'm ready for it. to end. <laughs> I think it's a pretty good compliment to give a song. Yeah. 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 So this is, so I don't remember the gentleman's name, the, the electronica guy. Yeah. Her name is Imogen heap. She's a okay. solo artist now. Um, she's got a couple of songs that did pretty well in the pop charts or whatever, but she does uh, very much electronica. You know, she does her all her own programming and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, this one she did she learned from this guy is my understanding um so the, their collaboration gotcha. kind of taught her the ropes of how to do your own thing and one of the things i thought was really cool was she will go and do live performances where she'll build the voice and the the um, instrumentation before and she'll she'll play it into a loop basically like she'll oh yeah right and then loop that and then she'll play a couple you know notes on the piano and loop that and then she'll do whatever and then she'll sing the whole song over it and it's right. just amazing to watch her kind of oh, build yeah. it build this machine and this engine right. that that goes that's so cool um, to see people do that like in yes. real time to watch them do it i'm like i have no idea how they do it. They make it look right. so easy and, and like not- flawless and it's not like a band. I mean, it's not, yeah. you know, there's no drummer. There's no, I mean, right. clearly all... it is a very different paradigm. It's a very different concept from, you know, a guitarist, a bass player, a keyboardist or whatever. Yeah. But it's still cool. It's still, it still can be art. And I think it's really fascinating. But anyway. I do too. Uh, it's beautiful. And I too, I found it off of that soundtrack. Okay. I, I was going to ask have, how you came about it because I was curious. If... I have mixed feelings about the movie because in some ways the movie's really, you know, twee and cute or whatever else. And in some ways, if you look at it, it's wrong. <laughs> like, yeah, right? I remember liking wreck. it when it came out, and then never yeah. wanting to watch it again. So <laughs> that uh, that should tell you something. I'm like, I don't know if I like this movie, and I like to keep that thought of it. Yeah. I probably shouldn't see it again. Everybody in that movie, except for oh, the poor actress's name, I can't think of it. I can't. Yeah. Um, mm. We're not here to talk movies anyway. <laughs> that's a, that's my excuse. Um, that's right. They're all horrible people. <laughs> it's just like there's no good person there's in no that great. movie. Everybody is equally guilty of some terrible behavior right. pattern. Um, and she's not. I mean, she's still wrapped up in it, so it's a whole thing. But anyway. Um, it's not the worst movie you could watch by far, but it's, it's but it's got this song in it. Uh, it's got this song, which is lovely. And it's got that delightful Zach Braff in it, who was in all those fun Scrubs episodes. Uh, yeah, but that that movie, he's his character is messed up. Anyway, <laughs> we're not yeah, moving on. Let's, let's moving, go. On. moving on. Um, <laughs> so that's two thumbs down for Garden State, but it's, it's two a, thumbs it's up a thumb left. and a half. I mean, yeah. it's a thumb and a half. Well, I gotta yeah. be. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I really haven't seen it since I saw it. I thought, oh, that was fun, <laughs> and I haven't thought about it since. <laughs> Ever let go by Fru Fru. Yes. So anyway, uh, it's a fine palate cleanser. It's a, it has a it lovely is. message, you know, that things 
you're as you put it so succinctly, yes. good things can come from broken things. Broken yes. things, right? Yeah, there's a uh, there's a crack in everything. That's where the light gets in. That's, that's where right. Cohen put it famously. That, and yeah, I think it's a that it's Japanese a art of repairing things and making them more beautiful. Oh, I wish I remembered it. Right. Hey, somebody send us an email. That's right. And remind you know, the us. best way to learn something is to be wrong about it. So <laughs> I'm going right. to call it Japanese. Nah, Japanese, I'm done. right? Or a <laughs> origami slime yeah. <laughs> eh, i don't know we'll make up <laughs> yeah. a word We're and then we'll, we'll, so many angry emails that's right we'll, we'll, we should say it with great authority then we'd really <laughs> get right. the angry emails <laughs> it is of course a thousand percent this <laughs> say that Very all good. right so that was let go by Fru Fru. Mm-hmm. nice pick <laughs> nice palate cleanser as you said that's a good so speaking of palates Speaking of palettes. <laughs> this is this is a lovely <laughs> nice attempt to, to be a segue. Uh, this, your song three is Couch Show by Steely Dan. Um, Damn. <laughs> let me be honest. I struggled with this one. I understand. It's fair. <laughs> I never really got Steely Dan. I do not get Steely Dan. That is a, yep, I get it. Mm. I feel like there's something there, but it is perennially out of my reach. I don't know okay. if it's the organ yeah. or it's the singing. Something. Or what it is. Yeah. I feel like it's a joke that I'm just not part of. Like, <laughs> I get it. You know, it's just like there's some kids that, get, that understand this joke. And here's me over here going, I don't. I, 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 don't, right. I, don't, I don't get it, man. <laughs> Somebody's going to have to explain it to me. I feel mm-hmm. like it's like everything wrong with 70s music in one, you know, easily ignorable package. <laughs> but it's important to you. It is. It is. To me. So, Will, thank you. I appreciate you, you, you fighting through. It's going to get a couple of plays from me to uh, try and unlock it. It's good. Uh, no matter how much, I think it's the love child between easy listening, smooth jazz, and AM radio. Uh, three inanimate c- concepts have had a tryst and produced a baby, and that baby is Steely Dan. Uh, uh, my God, this song goes on forever. This is my stream of consciousness <laughs> notes. This song Next. is five minutes and 30 seconds long. It is clearly a third the longest of the songs on your list. Just pointing out a fact uh-huh. hang on <laughs> oh shit i've been listening to the wrong song i played the album so i started with the song babylon sisters oh you instead started of with gaucho sisters okay okay we can work with that uh, i'm no, familiar no. with babylon again, sisters too. i realized my i'm gonna do that three or four more times and it's gonna make the whole <laughs> show better uh, i realized my mistake i've uh, gone on to the correct song and musically i had the same complaints and the music is still sure enough yeah not gonna if, it's, if I heard it on the radio. I'd immediately change the station. <laughs> um, but I don't listen to the radio that often, so it's probably So okay. it's uh, probably unlikely to happen. Yeah. Um, story-wise, I think the song is more going for it than uh, Babylon Sisters, which I don't understand the story of at all. Fair, fair enough. Um, <laughs> but it's amusing that my, my note was about the tryst, because I think that's what we have going on here. I think it's about someone who's being repeatedly cheated on. Uh, mm. I'm envisioning it's a closeted man who keeps having to hide their wild young lovers away um, but the young lovers don't really hide that they're extra flings that they have going on. And the lyrics really sound kind of exasperated. Like, I can't believe you keep doing this shit while I'm trying to keep it low key. <laughs> or my other interpretation is, is I wasn't sure that that's correct, but it, it could be that like, it's someone's agent who's trying to help them hide their um, behavior. Like hide your boy tour, man. You're supposed to be in the closet. I'm trying to do my best for <laughs> trying you. Trying to help you. Um, <laughs> Here's an aside. The horns make me think of the Saturday Night Live band from the 1990s. <laughs> that saxophone. This are, yep, these are all... Um, good I have more notes, because I listened to this a lot. I really did. I, I played it, and I played it after I realized I yeah. had the wrong song. That was so embarrassing. <laughs> like, I'm going to double that. I'm going to make it right. <laughs> I read something in the about the song that it might have been a metaphor for the drug addiction of the singer, that there's... Was, do you have any insight into that? Was that really a metaphor or oh, I, is this an overreach I, I on somebody I, else's part? I will fully confess that I'm not 100% sure what this song is about. I have my thoughts, but I don't. And, and one of the people in the band was seriously had a bad drug problem at this okay. time. So that's not out of. I mean, it was it was the early 80s, yeah. late 70s. Yeah. So Everybody had a bad drug everywhere. problem. <laughs> really? Yes, yeah. that's right. But mm, that's All right, last bit of notes. Possible. Okay. I want to I want to understand how I got the little try again tomorrow line stuck in my head. I've yeah. got to admit that I listened to it repeatedly, searching for what it was about, and I found it kind of interesting while I also really didn't like it. It's an interesting dichotomy because it's like an itch 
that it grows on you, but at the See? same time, I'm not sure you're enjoying the growth. <laughs> got a little, got a little Stockholm syndrome on you. you <laughs> kidnapped you. Maybe I don't want to be caught. Get out of yeah. my head, Steely Dan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that uh, that is a, a a totally fair <laughs> reading of that song, and actually, like Steely Dan is extremely divisive. Like people, it's kind of a love or hate yeah. Steely Dan, I think, and like all for all the reasons that you said. And this album in particular was been accused of like being too smooth, even for Steely Dan fans. <laughs> They're like they pushed it too far here, but yeah, the it's Quaaludes been referred to as deep. hippie music, Valium jazz. Jazz, TV <laughs> jazz, like you know, uh, yeah, you had you know it's, uh, the horns from the SNL band. I think actually that uh, Steve Albini even compared them to the SNL band before. Is like anybody who listens to Steely Dan's like listen wow. to, to the That's SNL. That's a timely uh, reference right there. It is actually, yeah, given away. that Steve Albini just passed. But yep. um, yeah, so um, I love Steely Dan. <laughs> I mean, I'm in of the course. camp of, of course people you who do. love Steely Dan, and I just don't know. Yeah, I love the. I've I've always kind of loved jazz, but not enough to like really get into like jazz because I love lyrics, I love songs and stories and things, and it's always been kind of a a hurdle for me with some jazz. The fact that there's not lyrics in a lot of jazz, right? Um, and so the type of jazz I like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. See, so Steely Dan kind of threads the needle for me, um, but. Gaucho has always been one of my favorite songs. And I think, I don't know what it's about, but I love the fact most Steely Dan songs are not about good people. Right. <laughs> they're, they're generally told from a point of view that is kind of suspect. And I think this one is too, I suspect that the narrator is quite racist, mm. in fact, and that he has perhaps a relationship with a secretary or some sort of underling who helps him, some kind of relationship, but that person has gotten involved with somebody that he doesn't like or approve of this gaucho amigo which is kind yeah. of a, a, a term for an argentinian cowboy which i take to be kind of an offhand sort of diss against this person there's See, the I reference later to the, to the I custard the, dome yeah 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 and, and, and yeah the it, custard dome and the cowboy thing. yeah right you'll never be welcome here high in the custard dome but yeah the, but the gay thing's interesting too like it could be a homosexual reference but it but it's clearly the, you're embarrassing me thing right it I is definitely went. that though right yeah. it's like hey i thought we were cool but you're embarrassing me by like bringing this person around or like having this person with us or i don't want to be associated with that guy i thought right. you knew so there's this kind of haughty attitude yes. to the narrator that that comes across and it's, it's one of the things i i dig about the way steely dan writes is it's not like you could listen to this song, I think, a lot, and not necessarily feel that the narrator's a terrible person. And then at some point, it kind of dawned on you. I think this narrator's not a great person. And like this song, you know, that I'm singing along to, you know, try again tomorrow. You know, you're gonna have that try again tomorrow line yeah. in your head. Um, but but you're, I, I think it's they're generally ambiguous enough to leave me guessing a bit. I'm sure we could Google and find ten guys who would tell us exactly what it's about, mm. or ten different opinions. <laughs> exactly, exactly ten about. different opinions. Yeah, um, yeah. That's, but that I, didn't help at all. No, and this was off their last album. Their last album. They they made albums um, from like seventy two to nineteen eighty. It was two guys, Becker and Fagan. They they started as a band. And they fired the rest of the band and decided they would just write stuff and hire studio musicians to record it. And they stopped touring. And this was kind of the the pin ultimate, like, we've done it all. We're just going to put, like, everything we've learned into one album. And it was a total shit show. <laughs> like, everything <laughs> fell apart. <laughs> it, was, it was ridiculous. I, I made some notes about the album that I think are fun. It's uh, It took two two years for them to record it. Wow. And it is 37 minutes long. And five of those minutes were actually stolen from a previous session because their engineer accidentally erased three quarters of one of their tracks. <laughs> and they're like, we got to have another song. So it took forever and is not that long. At the time it came out, it was the most expensive album ever made wow um they employed 42 different studio musicians to play on it and they disliked they had the best studio drummers 
They worked on LA. They worked in LA and New York. They had so two coasts worth of the best mm. studio musicians, and they were unhappy with their performances and paid their engineer $150,000 in 1980 to build like a drum machine for them that would basically play the, that they could program to play drums exactly the way they wanted it and replicate it and kind of move them around. And they named it Wendell and it eventually got a gold record for, for Gaucho for the album. But anyway, and it's there, it's full of like crazy stories. Walter Becker one half was the drug addicted half. He got hit by a car during the recording. Had So he had to work over the phone for like six months. And then he got out and his girlfriend OD'd and her parents sued him for her death, for wrongful death, saying that he had hooked her on hard drugs, which he probably did, but he got off. So anyway, it was just like one catastrophe after another in this two-year thing. And they released it and it's super divisive, even for Steely Dan fans. Like people, I love it, but a lot of Steely Dan fans are like, this album was one album too far you should stop the album before this was asia it was they were doing fine yeah. exactly you just like man that's too smooth even <laughs> for me um they also got sued by keith jarrett a jazz musician who mm-hmm. said that they stole the melody for the song gaucho from his album from like several years earlier and they listened to it and said yeah we totally heard that <laughs> gave him a writing credit that's all they that's how they solved it they're like we're nice. gonna make him a co-writer on gaucho because we're like yeah we heard that and now we see that we clearly kind of we didn't intend to but we ripped you off which many people take chagrin with because steely dan was particularly prickly later when a lot of their music wanted to be sampled by hip-hop mm. artists they were not super open to that so people are like yeah. oh, well, that's so anyway probably you know not guys you would want to have a sunday cook out with <laughs> but still um gaucho 1980 um one of my key steely dan moments but obviously as robert points out if you not mine steely dan, yeah. if you don't dig the dan you're not yeah it's not going to be your gateway in i think i think that's, <laughs> that's fair true thing <laughs> on to number four on robert's four. list i have reptile by periphery and this. i'm sorry is the longest song on the list, clocking in at 16 minutes and 44 seconds off of Periphery 4, Hail Stan, is the album. And that's from, this is a relatively recent one, from 2019. Yep. And as Steely Dan broke Robert, this one broke me a little. <laughs> I mean, I've, I made some notes. I'm like, <laughs> it's, a, it's real, str- again, like, prog metal and like maybe the screamiest one we've had <laughs> it's a dude screams a lot like a lot um but it's got a lot of the elements that we you know like it's stringy and kind of classical you know clearly there's some classical music influence and it has sort of symphonically like the sections right rather than kind of verses and choruses um but it is like when it goes it goes man this thing goes hard like it is guitar bass drums everything's like super bombastic when it goes and this guy's got the cookie monster voice down too like when he needs to he can really go Uh, the vocal i'm always impressed by the range of these dudes it's like from a little whisper to like the crazy howl or yawp and um and this one in particular seems to like modulate between these like really crushingly heavy parts and like opens up kind of almost like soundscapes kind of mm-hmm. like, where you know, ambient kind of stuff, um, which I, I like that. I like, just to have like the movement of it through it. Um, and there's like some choral arrangement stuff where it sounds like you're like the, the, the Omen movie, ha, 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 ha. You know, kind of like a, a yeah, chorus yeah. stuff going in there that, that, that sounds pretty, pretty cool. Um, is it fair? I, I wrote in my notes, is it fair to say that this is more speed medley than a lot of the stuff that we looked at? Like there's some stuff about it that, that, that's, that feels more like my dalliance with speed metal in the eighties. And then I learned about a term called gent. That I'm I so would sorry. like you to tell us <laughs> <I'm> about. So, <laughs> so, 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 this is a rabbit hole. This is this is we are on a trip down a rabbit hole, and there is no bottom. It will just <laughs> there going. is no bottom. Okay, yeah. so, I've been warned. Yes, gent is a term for a certain type of metal which is heavily 
palm muted so yeah. that the chords don't ring at all. They just chuck. Right. And mm. and that's this is of that it's not really a genre. In fact, their album number five is called Gent is not a genre. <laughs> See? <laughs> but they joke about it. I mean it's a right. whole it is a whole thing and, and they kind of they're both part of it, but also mocking it, but also sure. loving mm. it at the same time. So um yeah, it's it's got some thrash, it's got some speed. Okay. Um one of the, the elements that's really interesting about this band is that they have three guitar players. Um, and that's kind of rare. It's, it's rare yeah. that you can fit three people into this kind of music, and yet they do. Um, and it's phenomenal. But please, continue. Yeah. No, I uh, actually, that's about all. <laughs> I, I, I confess, you know, I, I guess uh, so content-wise, I wasn't yeah. sure. No, I listened to it several times, actually. <laughs> but it was hard. I confess it was hard to, like, stay with it because it's so long. I kept yeah. looking. I'm like, surely it's almost over. I'm like, no, dude, you're halfway through. Yeah. I'm like, there's still nine minutes. Of that. I'm like, okay, well, you just take it, take it piece by piece. But I listened to it several times and tried to, and I looked at the lyrics, and I read a little bit about the band. I just had a hard time finding a way into this one and it sings about green skins and i'm like is this about warhammer 40k orcs <laughs> what is this about and so i don't know what it's about and musically it's 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 difficult for me to get into so i so i struggled with this one that's that's more than fair and, and i think we are even at this point. <laughs> we, are, we are even yep. i made you listen um, to jazz you made me listen to <laughs> gent <laughs> so the song is about maybe um, an alien invasion, the green skin bastards, and reptile being a, a reference. Reptile, to that. okay, um, and also green. that they they that, that they sense. float, they float in the water. Um, oh, so there's okay. they don't really go into super detail, but there's some sort of invasion of the earth, and uh, it's a horrific time. And okay. at the end, I'm pretty sure we lose. I'm pretty sure that humanity is 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 just about wiped out by it. Um, it's hard. It's it, again, it's not super clear. Um, but they talk about the soil we own becomes yeah. us. And I'm thinking we're dead and buried. We're dead Fantastic. and buried, yeah. Like we're becoming um, the soil. But it is very much an unreliable narrator because the first line of the song is his name is Billy and he liked to get high. High, that's right. Yeah, I mean, it starts like that. And I'm like, oh, it's kind of like a little more down to earth kind of like now song. But then it goes yeah. where but it, it goes. Might just, so but it could yeah. all be hallucinations. It could all be, could all be yeah. in his head. Um, because he's the hero. He is a hero of the he story. Is. Um, you know, he's just smarter than the generals and he's smarter than, you know, all the right. wise men of the world because he knows how to fight and he knows how to, to win, um, sort of. Oh, Billy. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really, it's a very long song and it's got a lot of ups and downs and it's got some, some cool atmospheric pieces and parts or whatever. It does. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's good. Got a lot I really of variety. enjoy it. Uh, so my question, can I, I have a question is about how, and this is kind of a broad prog metal question for, mm-hmm. for people like me who are not as steeped in the genre as you are. What's like, you like a listen, feedback, sir. When, when you listen to an album, like, do you listen to like a song? Do you listen to the whole album together? Do you have, do you like have this on when you're working or do you have to be in like a particular headspace to pay attention to it? I'm just curious, like how... So, uh, how Great questions. Uh, I I'm an album listener primarily. I will okay. spend more time yeah. putting on a single album and and going through the whole thing. Uh, not not always, but that is probably my more majority thing. Is I will okay. say, yeah. you know, excuse me, Alexa, you know, play whatever. Right. Uh, mm. That that was dumb. That really didn't help the story at all. Uh, I will say, you know, play uh, <laughs> they, Periphery for uh, right. Play the album, but you yes. haven't played the play the album so, from, the start from the beginning. This song in particular is is you know, such a tour de force. I can't really listen to this while I'm doing normal work. Anything you know, else. If I'm, yeah. if I'm devoted to you know trying to concentrate on one thing, this will distract the hell out of me because it's just yeah. so epic and soaring and powerful. Right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it does vary. I more often don't listen to things that I have this kind of love for. It's like yeah. I can enjoy the music but not enjoy it too much. Uh, while I'm I'm working or whatever, so right, yeah, it's not a yeah, it's, it doesn't do as well for you as a casual listen. No, where you'd have it because you want to pay attention. It demands a lot of attention. I enjoy it is, it. When I listen yeah. to it, it is difficult. Like it draws your attention because of those transitions. It's is you know, yeah, it's difficult to. It's not musical wallpaper, man. No, not at all. <laughs> this is uh, not periphery musical wallpaper. Yeah, is a Maryland band, which of course yeah. got to rep the home right, state, right in the neighborhood. Not, there, not enough Maryland you. metal. Uh, the singer, though, is from San Diego, and prior to joining Periphery, had not been a screamer. He was just a, a normal singer. He joined Periphery, <laughs> and he joined regular. Gent, 
became and a singer. That it required him to scream to, to yeah. go into the harsh vocals, and so he did it. So he started out nice. with their first album, and he's been their singer for the entirety of that I've listened to them. Um, because the, they had a singer before him who did not record, or they re-recorded the album. I'm not sure which. Okay. <laughs> um, so he's the only one who's recorded with them, or at least it's been released. Yeah. Um, he's a hell of a singer. He he really you know he does he he goes from high to low really oh, well. Yeah. Um, he Great did range. say recording this Crazy. song that he had to do this at like the last thing he did because this tore his throat out. Yeah. Yeah. Getting some of those screams. Um, yeah, no, he's got, oh, he does some like vocally some crazy impressive things yeah. on here that must have hurt. <laughs> and you can say that as a musician. I, as I, 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 yes, yeah. I've hurt myself and I'm sure this guy has too <laughs> lots of times. Yeah. Very oh, good. Periphery. Nice. And they're still making albums, right? Yes. They're still, yep. still, yep. still together. Still about making a year stuff. and a half old, I think. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Mm. Periphery. <laughs> reptile all right i know more than i did before it's true it's good may not need it to but but you know it anyway. <laughs> it's a hey hey it's all about learning man that's We're right learning <laughs> all good all right and that's a good transition to i don't know it's probably <laughs> i tried increasingly painful all right uh so your song for was garden party by rick or ricky nelson depending on what era you grew up in i suppose that's right <laughs> um so this song seems very straightforward on its face, but it's not super clear necessarily what it means anyway. Uh, the narrator goes to a garden party, but nobody knows him anymore. He sings some of his old songs, and then he sings some of his new music, and that gets ignored. It's kind of like play the hits or get out. <laughs> uh, but then I'm reading the annotations on the lyrics, and it's not exactly a typical garden party there, Damon. That's right. He's talking about Madison Square Garden in New York yeah. City. The big not, garden. Not your average, you know, uh, concert. Uh, it's kind of a big place. And there's a lot of coded references to other big stars of the day, like Yoko Ono and George Harrison, um, which I thought was was interesting because I didn't know beyond that he was, you know, in Ozzy and Harriet. Yeah. Much about him. Like, I, right. I was not really aware that he was a musical artist. So yeah. what Ricky do you know Nelson. about Ricky Nelson? Well, Ricky, Nel- you know, I probably encountered Ricky Nelson on um, – Nick at night as a kid <laughs> yeah. on Ozzy and Harriet because he would right. you know, they would show all the old sitcoms and the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. It's an old black and white sitcoms, a radio show before that to give you some sense of how old it was. But um, Ozzy and Harriet Nelson were a real husband and wife who did these shows, and um, and they involved their kids. And Rick Ricky Nelson was was their kid, and he started out on the show. And at some point somebody like put a guitar in his hand and taught him how to play something. And he really liked it and was good at it. And he started recording songs, largely, you know, stuff written by other people, but he had a few big mm-hmm. hits like traveling man was kind of a big hit and traveling man seen a lot of stops all over the world. You know, there, he did a lot of these kind of like late fifties, thinking rambling sixties. You're thinking of rambling, rambling yeah. man would be a later variation, yeah. but, um, <laughs> Yeah, he did. Um, he covered some you know, Hello, Mary Lou was a big hit for him. Mm-hmm. Hello, Mary Lou, Goodbye Heart was kind of a, you know, sort of an Everly Brothers sounded kind of tune. But he did. He sort of became famous in this kind of like 50s, 60s sort of, you know, um, heartthrob uh, crooner vein. And um, and then he grew up. And, and as happens to these kids who are not famous, cute no more. They, they grow up, they're not cute anymore. Yeah, that's exactly it. And his career kind of dried up after the show. And, um, you know, he, he wasn't making any hit records. And he was really interested in kind of what was going on musically at the start of the 70s. So he forms his own band. He grows his hair long and they do like this finger picking kind of country sort of eagle kind of style mm-hmm. and that, that he wants to do. And the story goes that he um, was booed off the stage at Madison Square Garden for playing with his band um, and play like they played like a countryfied version of Honky Tonk Woman by the Stones, and they booed him off the stage. Um, and he wrote this song about you know that experience. Now there's you know 
a lot of people who've since taken umbrage with his reading of that and say that in fact something else was going on he wasn't even being booed the booing was about something else but anyway ricky (laughs) took it personally and wrote this song that basically um i remember it was one that i heard as a kid driving around delivering flowers that summer when I only had the AM radio, <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> and I pulled over to find out who did it. And I'm like, who sang this song? Cause I had no idea. You had and they did call the radio station. I back called in the, the radio day. station. Yeah. I stopped. Oh, the, the, this story involves all sorts of stuff that doesn't exist anymore. I pulled over my little panel truck to the payphone. <laughs> I called the radio station oh. to say, who did you just play? Um, I'm sorry, listeners me, and viewers. We exactly, are old. We exactly. are men of a certain we are, age. We are men of a certain age. And, um, and so they told me who did it. And I went home and told my dad, I'm like, I heard this song. Have you ever heard it? And he's like, yeah. And he's the one who told me the story, uh. the Madison Square Garden story. Because like you, I'm like, I don't really know what it's about, you know, until I have that reference. But I loved, you know, the. The chorus is kind of famous for being, um, you, know, uh, you can't please everyone, so you got to please yourself, right? That's right. sort of the, the chorus. Yourself. And I, yeah, right? Be true to yourself. And uh, it has a great line at the end where if memories were all I sang, I'd rather drive a truck. <laughs> like, and that's always those lines always really resonated with me. So I've kept this song like in my pocket for whenever I've had like, tough career decisions to make <laughs> I'm like let's listen to garden party a lot and that will put me in an okay headspace to like make this decision you know based on what i really want and not on what maybe i think other people think i should do or um so yeah I, overall i really like the message and um and I like, you know, I, I like Ricky Nelson. I like those tunes. And and I feel kind of bad for him that he wound up in this. It seems like a, a place that a lot of like young artists who do really well early on end up. It's like when they right. become adults, they no longer have a way back to that kind of success that they had as a kid. And they spend a lot of their life kind of chasing it or doing or just giving up and doing something else. Right. Going into a different line of work. And quote the Simpsons, the older they get, the cuter they ain't. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Yeah, no, he was a cute kid. He was a good looking kid. And, you know, and he grew up into a man. And for whatever reason, that was less interesting to the world. Well, you know, you're not a teen heartthrob anymore. And therefore, the certain, uh, well, you know, there's there's an argument to be made that the new kids on the block and and, uh, NSYNC or whatever that's still touring now have, have found a way to sustain that in ways that the older generations never figured out right um because yeah it's like because um gosh the guy from the partridge family oh yeah um, david cassidy (laughs) yeah you know went into hard hard drugs because he could not find fame you know he no longer was the cute kid that that people wanted to buy and now he was this you know average looking adult or even good looking adult whatever but he no longer he he the package was not what they were buying. <laughs> That's um, right. It wasn't what they wanted anymore. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a neat way to, it's, uh, it's also a story that takes like a personal experience and expands it out into mm-hmm. something that I think, you know, even if you don't know the story, it's fun to listen to and kind of puzzle out what he's talking about. Right. But if you know just a little bit of the story, it's fun, as you said, to kind of spot the other people he mentions like Yoko Ono and, you know, George Harrison and talks about the folks who are kind of, you know, Yoko brought her walrus. <laughs> it's kind of a fun line. I'm like, oh, I know what that means. So, yeah, I think it's a it's a great song and a good uh, one I go back to when I need to like to I need self to be make true. a real good decision, Robert. <laughs> I need to need to make a Damon decision. Like I got to listen to Ricky Nelson tell me. Nice. I gotta, He's got to help you on the way. I got to please right. myself. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, number so, 5. To please oh. yourself. For the last time this episode. To please myself, the last time this episode, we will talk about the fifth pick on Robert's list, which is The Royal We by Silver Sun Pickups. And man, every time I think you've surprised me in all the ways you can, you surprise me again. (laughs) This one is, uh, it's definitely poppier. Mm-hmm. And then ev- almost everything else on this list, maybe not the frou-frou, maybe the exception to that. Um, but that's not to say uh, that it's gentle necessarily. It's got some crunch to it and some heft to it. Um, it's rocking. 
it's not like it's definitely not prog metal i mean we're in a different sort of genre here it's more like alternative rock but it's pretty it's pretty crunchy and um it's got some like the the studio version's got like some synth strings Mm -hmm. or you know some kind of synth on it that really sort of bulk it out to um it's got a real melodic vocal delivery um i like the guy he's got kind of a um I almost initially thought it was a female vocalist mm-hmm. because he's it's, got he, kind of a he voice. He straddles the feminine, masculine, yeah, 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 alto yeah. Range. Which, which I really liked. I think it's a, yeah. it makes for a neat quality to the voice and um, for some and, reason. And I always think of him as like cat-like. Like his, yeah. his voice has got some, I, and cats don't sing, so this is the weirdest <laughs> thing in the you know, world. But, but it's, it's like this feline quality to yeah. it of the way he kind of floats. I don't know. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, no, it's that, hard to describe, but it, yeah. it, it, in my head, it makes sense. That's fair, right? Yeah. Is he singing <laughs> or meowing? No. I, <laughs> I get that right. <laughs> All right. Let's get serious, meow. Um, yeah. Lyrically, <laughs> lyrically, I'm confused about what's going on here. I tr- I think, I, I wrote down a few different things. So like mm-hmm. every time I listened to it, I wrote a different thing that I thought it was. I'm like, is this a song about getting ready for war? I don't think so. Is no. it a love song? Well, everything's kind of a love song. Is yeah. it like about a former lover who let you down? Maybe. And then I thought, well, maybe it's another addict, like an ad, like an addict song. I thought, well, what if it's all just this one guy talking to himself and like his head is, you know, addictions almost talking to like a voice in the head, like the Royal we, like there's more than one person in here and i kind of like that one i don't know if that's what's happening but that's kind of where i settled that was the last idea i had but um i like this a lot it feels i forget what year this was i forgot to say it's on um the album swoon from 2009 does that sound Mm -hmm. right i think so. so yeah and it's four minutes and 45 seconds long the shortest song on robert's list that, oh no, that's not no, no. the second Fru-fru shortest. Shorter. Fru-fru yeah, is yeah. the shortest, thirty yeah. seconds short. You're right. So, um, but yeah, I like this. I've never heard of this band. I didn't know, and I think it's two people or like I no, mean, it's, a, I it's, a, it's, it's a four it's piece, a three piece. Yeah. Sorry, it's a drummer and like drummer. A, the bass player, and he sings and plays guitar. And there's a, a keyboardist organist. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but yeah, I don't know anything about them i like the song and i'm like i wonder why i haven't heard of these guys before it's probably a damon problem and not a silver sun <laughs> well you know you problem. haven't bought an album since 2000 so. or <laughs> 1990 not strictly was it? true but 1990 <laughs> okay all right i haven't bought one with um, great enthusiasm since then. <laughs> silver sun pickups is a band out of silver lake california i think it's oh called? yeah i know silver i know of okay. silver lake anyway yeah okay um, so they're super, super musically tight. I mean, every one of them oh, yeah. is a virtuosic, is that a word? It's like a word. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. Musician. Uh, the singer, I, when I first heard him, it was another song on the same album called Panic Switch. And I thought he sounded kind of like nineties era smashing pumpkins, Billy Corgan. Okay. Yeah. And I he, he does that. some, of, he got some of that sound. And I think yeah. too, Billy Corgan had that kind of, that feline kind of, yeah. Maybe it's like a purr to it. It's, it's it's very silky smooth. But anyway, yeah, I have a um, hard time, but I understand exactly what you're referring to. I can't really put. Yeah, it's hard to put your finger either. on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they are they're they're excellent musicians. They're excellent songwriters. Um, I think this is their best album. Sadly, I don't yeah. think the the more recent stuff is as good as this one. It just okay. sometimes you know it's the one that grabs you. Yeah, the rest of them I, just don't have the same hooks. There's great songs on the other albums, but this one. Again, it's one of those albums I can put on and just end to end enjoy. Uh, yeah. Every song is, every is, song. is worthwhile. It's nice. Mm. Um, I think this song is is very hard to pin down exactly what it okay. is, <laughs> what it means. Um, but I think it's a kiss off. I think it's a yeah, like um, a getting you. ready to to leave someone. Okay. Uh, song at least, unless I'm thinking of a different song. By <laughs> uh, it's, I I do think it's. Um, yeah, because I think the end is you'll be lying on the floor and you'll find the note signed the Royal We. Right, the Royal We. Yeah, that's right. We're out. Yeah, <laughs> I'm right. Gone. yeah right. I'm out. Yeah, uh, I'm gone. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the Royal We, meaning not you. Exactly. <laughs> royal We. <laughs> um, I, but I'm not certain about that because n- their songs, none of them are very straightforward. Uh, yeah. The Panic Switch kind of is because it's it's about, you know running away from things um yeah. but anyway i think it's, oh, it's, it's a worthwhile listen i really like them a lot and i i'm i'm so amazed that they're such good musicians like if you see the drummer he belongs in a much faster paced metal band because oh. he just 
he can play his heart out on like a three piece too. It's insane. Yeah, I um, mean, it's pretty. Yeah, but technically yeah. they're all doing stuff. You know, bass yes. player, the guitar, like it, it's all pretty impressive. And it's like, and it's not gentle. Like you no. know, it's got some chug yeah, to yeah. it. And you know, you it it feels you know it's not again it doesn't feel like metal music, but it feels like some harder like it's aggressive rock, right? Alternative. Aggressive. Sure. Yeah. 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 So I love it. I, I'm a big fan of theirs. Um, I, I, I one one more note: the bass player is a, a woman, which yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but she has a beautiful voice. She doesn't sing on that oh. many of their songs, but the songs she does sing on, I think, are very elevated by. It. Oh, cool. It's really weird that she sings so well, but they don't do it very often. Very few. Yeah. yeah. So huh. just just a side note that I think What's is really interesting, um, and letter. especially since he has such a feminine. Right. Quality to think, his voice. I mean, taking nothing away from him. He's, yeah. Oh, sure. I can't do they sing, sing together when she sings or do yes. they sing? Okay. So well, they sometimes sing... she sings kind of the lead and he okay. sings the, the backing. Okay. And sometimes okay. they do. Um, there's a couple of songs. I can, I'll pass them on to you. That's interesting. Um, Cause I they, bet his voice, harmonize. like that quality that we were talking yes. about, I bet it would sound really good with another voice, like yes. paired with another voice. It sounds great on its own, but I'm like, Oh, I bet that guy could sing harmony like business uh, yeah indeed so yeah no it's good and I, I like the lyrics too it's like but to your point yeah it's a sort of it's a little opaque as to what they mean but they're pretty yeah. evocative and they're easy to follow and his his voice delivers them really well so yeah silver sun good, pickups good times so yeah, all right. check the, i, I check think i ended out. ended on a high note uh, i think uh, so <laughs> no i like yeah yeah no i actually every <laughs> It was it was another good list, Robert. I'm Thank not going to go out and buy all my prog metal records <laughs> yet, but right, I'm so closer. When you're ready, I've got. When I'm ready, you. I'm yeah. closer. All right. Your song five, sir. Song five. Ending on a high note as well, <laughs> but I really have very little to say about it. So okay. I'm the one by Danzig. Glenn Danzig. <laughs> and Danzig, this song in particular, especially. Particular, spe- eh, whatever. Yeah, that's okay. We'll, we'll, we will <laughs> allow it. The royal we will allow it. What, what if Elvis wanted to kill people and eat them? <laughs> I have no proof that Glenn Danzig has ever killed and ate a person, but what have you heard from Chuck Biscuits recently? Uh, <laughs> that's, I don't know. No, but that's an excellent name, Chuck Biscuits. Yes, yeah, he, was, he was the drummer for the first He was the, the first drummer album. for, yeah, yes. I think so, yeah. Um, <laughs> It, it, I mean, again, it's sort of like with um, uh, what was you had one last time that I just I, I don't know what what can you add? What can you say more about the you know, great Glenn Danzig? When I was seventeen, I thought the album this is on this is on Danzig's second album mm-hmm. was perfect. <laughs> it was the best. I listened to this album over and over again in my car. I thought it was pretty perfect when I was 17. It's the second Danzig album of two, both produced by Rick Rubin, Mm -hmm. which, you know, so sound wise, like pretty much nailed it. And I've just always been like a misfit. I was a misfits fan before. So he had a band called the misfits, Sam Hain. He did kind of like an in-between band. And then in the nineties, the late, or excuse me, the late eighties, he formed this band dancing. That was kind of like a dark blues band almost. With um, a but lot he's, of, I mean, they were metal blues. Yeah. Metal. Yeah. With, yeah kind of clearly blues influence. Yeah. Yeah. The right way to say it. Cause they were yeah, clearly metal, but, but kind of a more laid back feel where a lot of the misfit stuff was like really chuggy and, and driving yeah. and super terrible sound quality <laughs> we'll talk about that <laughs> when we talk about the misfits sometime yes. which really happen but but i always liked um i love his voice because he sounds like elvis like he's a sort of like the metal elvis and particularly back in this era like he actually yes. did a cover album of elvis songs recently and it's oh. not great oh. <laughs> That's voice disappointing. it's not what it was it's better in my head than, than the I, reality exactly. then. Okay. um so and I just love this song because it always sounded to me like, yeah, like what, like if I wanted evil Elvis, what would that sound like? And it's like this, it's a very like slinky guitar based yep. tune. It's kind of like a real honky tonk feel. And I mean, it's a, to the point, you know, we talked about that Elvis song, maybe like back on the first list where yeah. we had like badass Elvis. And this just like takes it a little further. It's like further <laughs> yeah. than Elvis could go. Yeah. We, and Glenn can go and talk about like being 
uh, like the chosen one, essentially. And lyrically, they're always kind of, you know, you can sort of dismiss. Little cheese. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's like any metal music. If you try to take it at face value, it's it's a thin line between clever and stupid. So. Yeah, it was easier when we were teenagers to be like, <laughs> yeah, now it's like, that's eh, right. All right. Uh, yeah. I get what you're and, going for. Right. And I think 18 year old me loved it. Exactly. 18 year old me loved it. And I do like one of the things that I think this was maybe the first example of for me was the idea that um, you can I always love the sound of the acoustic guitar um, and it's just sort of like cleaner guitars. Mm -hmm. And this song was like, oh, wait a minute. You can do other types of music with that kind of instrumentation. Like it's a real sort of like stripped down you know, like honky tonk or sort of country instrumentation, but it's but not ominous. a country song, you know? Right. And, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, that's kind of cool. This idea that, that there was another way into metal with like different instruments. And I've been kind of interested in that for a long time. And I think we've seen more of it with bands like folk punk bands and things, yeah. you know, where they're like different instruments, but playing like, you know, the type of music you wouldn't traditionally expect to see. And I think this was one of the first songs for me, like back in the teenage years where I'm like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Glenn. Like I see what you did there. Like you're hearkening back to this type of music that, you know, a lot of people don't know, but you're couching it kind of on your metal album. And, you know, with a lot of sort of metal trappings. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And kind of making it. Yeah. Like heavy. And so, so yeah, I just, just a sucker for Danzig. That's all I (laughs) met him. This, oh, really? uh, when that in 1990 when this came out i ran into him at the chicago comic-con which used to be kind of a big deal for people who've been comic nerds for a long time before back when i was a kid the com the chicago one was the big one um that was wizard world for a while wasn't it it was wizard world later this was even later. before it became okay. wizard world yeah okay. yeah i think it was pretty close though i forget whether it was a 91 or 92 it was shortly thereafter it became the wizard thing but um, he was there with like Moondog comics. So he was a big collector back yeah. in the day. Yeah. And he, would, uh, he was he a would, nerd. He was just a real mean one. <laughs> he was a mean, he was a mean, tough nerd. Yeah. 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 That's, that's what I heard. But yeah. There's, um, so there's a cool, it might be on Reddit. I forget. Of Danzig looking at things. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. And it's just him kind of mean mugging stuff. Like cat litter. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> There are a lot of pictures on the internet of Danzig carrying cat litter because yeah. apparently everybody thinks it's pretty awesome that he has I cats. Mean, that's pretty funny. It's pretty funny. It is. So it's a normal human being thing, but it's also Glenn Danzig. Exactly. Doing it, so. we, we don't expect Glenn Danzig to do the normal human thing because he never breaks the kayfabe. No, he keeps right. it going right a hundred percent. Never breaks character. It's hard. Uh, yeah, you know, and that's the thing. He was one of those that, like, some of the metal bands, like Typo Negative, we talked yeah, about them last yeah. time. Yeah, talk about last They time. were fully in on the joke. They totally right. got that their image exactly. was ridiculous, that, you know, right. blind their, the blind, let will try that in English, <laughs> dyeing their hair black and, you know, yeah. singing in these deep registers and, right. and whatever. It was for girls. It was for fame. It was, I mean, they were musicians, absolutely. Sure. <laughs> but, like, they got what they were doing was not... You know, not a hundred percent serious, art. right? Yeah. Exactly. Glenn Danzig does not seem to be in on that. Nope. He seems mm. to be living the angry metal god that he is, <laughs> twenty four by seven. That's right. Mm. I hope yeah. he's listening. Great on you, Glenn. That's right. I hope he's in on the joke in yeah. his private time. Right, but, but he, not yeah. on, not on public face. <laughs> but no. but in the public face, Glenn has no time for anything that's not evil and metal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, we've done it again, man. We've another perfectly good hour hour wasted. An hour and a half. We've done it. Oh my! Seems to be like our sticking point. Yeah. Like we take ninety minutes. Sorry, folks. You're just gonna have to, you know, (laughs) carve out more time. Extra half hour, (laughs) right? Mm. (laughs) Very good. Well, thank you, Damon. Thank you, Robert. We will. uh, We will be back with another list. Yes, I'm excited. So there's more uh, songs out there. We're going to talk about them. That's right. We'll put uh, we'll add these to our playlist and, and put the link to that wherever you're finding this guy. And yep. we'll be back with ten new ones next month. Sorry, we just won't probably come out a little in late. June, so we're a little late. But uh, just blame me. That's my fault. I've been, no, I've, yeah. been, I've been gallivanting around, so we had to Ugh. record here at the end of May. So this I'll get this lifestyle. out. 
probably. That's right. It's that jet set lifestyle that I lead. Just off and running on a moment's notice. Very good. All right. Well, thank everybody. you, sir. We'll thank talk you, soon, sir. everybody. Thank you. All right. And keep on listening. That sounds pretty awesome, right? It does. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs> Bye. Bandersnatch Production.